The story you're about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts about historical characters, events, or locations. Please sit back and listen as I narrate this story to you. Almost every culture has a story about creatures or beings who return from the afterlife to feast on the living during the hours of darkness. Over the last century or so, the vampire has taken on a whole new persona in the West. The origins of pop culture's most famous monster can be found in Eastern European folklore. Similar creatures, however, have existed for thousands of years in various civilizations. In the 1800s, Augustus Hare described the Kruglin Grange vampire in his autobiography, Story of My Life, as an early incarnation of the bloodsucker. The Kruglin vampire was said to be at least two centuries old. Perhaps this story is just that, a story. Hare, on the other hand, portrayed it as one founded on truth. The type of literature or storytelling found in Penny Dreadful pamphlets was popular at that time. These were works of fictions that were typically about pirates and highwaymen and were written in a gothic style. The following story about the Kruglin Grange vampire may be an example of that style or it may be the Victorian equivalent of an urban legend. Despite this, many people believe that there was some truth to the story. Captain Fisher, according to Augustus Hare, told him a really extraordinary story connected with his own family. The Fisher family had a long history in Cumberland, having lived at Kruglin Grange for several centuries. The family eventually outgrew their home. As a result, they made a decision to relocate to the south. Instead of leaving their property empty, they leased it to paying tenants. The Cranswell siblings, two brothers and a sister, moved into the single-story farmhouse which has a terrace from which large grounds sweep away towards the church in the hollow separated by a belt of trees. The Cranswells enjoyed living at Kroglin Grange and quickly became well-known in the surrounding community. According to Hare, to their poorer neighbors, they were all that is kind and beneficent, and their higher-class neighbors spoke of them as the most welcome addition to the little society of the neighborhood. Winter passed without incident. The following summer was hot and humid. On one particularly hot night, the tenants took advantage of the opportunity to gaze at the moon before retiring for the night. Amelia, the sister, sat on top of her bed and shut the bedroom window. Though her windows were closed, she hadn't closed the shutters because she felt it wasn't necessary in such a peaceful and unthreatening setting. Amelia stared out her window, unable to sleep due to the heat. Beyond a line of trees stood a church with its own graveyard. Her vision caught a glimpse of something hidden in the twilight. Two flickering lights appeared to be moving among the trees visible through her window. She was initially intrigued, but the longer she watched, the more nervous she became. Both lights began to emerge from the tree line and into view in a matter of seconds. The lights appeared to be a small part of a larger form, possibly a humanoid form. She was gripped by the most uncontrollable terror as she watched it. She wished she could escape, but the door was too close to the window. She wanted to scream, but her voice was paralyzed. The startled and terrified young lady felt compelled to act as the figure approached the farmhouse in a shambling walk. Amelia dashed to the front door, arriving just in time to open it. It appears that this could not have come at a better time. Amelia could hear a scratching sound coming from her bedroom window as she struggled with the lock. Despite her growing terror, she dared to take one step back. A hideous face with fierce glaring eyes stood almost entirely outside the window. For a few seconds, bony fingers tried to open the window before giving up. She found some solace in knowing that the window was securely fastened shut, but a new noise made Amelia even more terrified. Whatever was outside was now picking at the window's lead seals. This sound had rendered her immobile, and then another had made her blood run cold. A diamond-cut pane of glass shattered into the room. A long bony finger entered and turned the handle, opening the window and allowing the creature to enter. It approached her and she wanted to scream, but her throat seemed paralyzed and her tongue felt clamped to the roof of her mouth. Unable to move or even raise an alarm, the creature approached the bed and twisted its long bony finger into her hair, dragging it over the side of the bed and biting her violently in the throat. She could finally scream. Her shrieking drew the attention of both of her brothers, who arrived to investigate. When they discovered the door was locked, 
they searched for a poker to use it to pry it open, losing a crucial minute as the creature bit deeper into their sister's neck. They pried open the door with the poker and rushed into the room, just in time to see the creature escape through the window. Their unconscious sister was draped over the side of the bed, bleeding violently from a wound in her throat. One brother pursued the vampire, but he was no match for the creature's massive strides. It vanished beyond the churchyard's wall. Amelia was bleeding profusely, but mistook her assailant for an escaped convict from a mental institution. Given her ordeal and her self-perception as a girl with little superstition, it was perhaps an understandable conclusion. Amelia did recover from her wounds, but she needed time to rest. Her doctor insisted that for her to fully recover, she needed a change of scenery. Her brothers took her to Switzerland where they engaged in typical Victorian tourist activities such as climbing mountains, picking and preserving plants, and sketching. However, as autumn approached, Amelia insisted on returning to Kroglin Grange. After all, they had rented the property for seven years. Despite the events, she and her brothers liked the neighborhood and were well-liked by the other residents. Amelia made a decision as she returned, insisting that lunatics do not escape every day of the week. Amelia's brothers, except for the vampire attacks, were also missing their pleasant life at Kroglin, so they agreed to her suggestion and the three returned. However, because Kroglin Grange only had one story, it was difficult to make their living arrangements more secure. Amelia moved into her former bedroom, but she always shut the shutters at night. However, as was common in many old houses, the shutters left the top of the window pane exposed. The brothers now shared a room across the hall from Amelia's and kept loaded pistols by their bedsides. The siblings had a happy and uneventful winter at the Grange, despite hearing some disturbing reports of animals found dead with gashes in their throats. Amelia began to hear the unmistakable scratching at her window again in March of the following year. When she looked up, she saw the same hideous shriveled face she'd seen the previous summer, staring down at her from the top of the window with blazing eyes. This time, she acted quickly and decisively, screaming for help before the previous creature gained access to her room. Her brothers were both quick to respond, and this time they were armed. Her screams forced the creature to flee, and it was about to return the way it had come when one of the brothers took aim and fired. Despite being hit in the leg, the monster managed to flee. Only this time, the brothers were successful in locating it. The beast had taken refuge inside a crypt belonging to a local family. At that time, the brothers decided against entering the crypt. Instead, they'd form a posse and go on the hunt at dawn. When they opened the tomb the next morning, a horrifying scene was revealed. The vault was full of coffins. They had been broken open and their contents were horribly mangled and distorted on the floor. Only one coffin remained undamaged. The lid had been lifted, but it remained loose on the coffin. They erased it and there, brown, withered, shriveled, mummified, but perfectly intact, was the same hideous figure who had peered through the windows of Kroglin Grange with the marks of a recent pistol shot in the leg. They removed the body, carried it outside the crypt, and set it ablaze. Some say they drew the vampire to a holly tree in the churchyard because holly was thought to be beneficial in such an operation in local folklore. They incinerated the dreadful cadaver there and the Kroglin vampire's atrocities ceased. Some people believe the story never happened. Charles Harper decided to investigate the legend. He traveled to Cumberland and began researching, despite his reservations about the account's veracity. Kroglin Hall did not exist, as Harper discovered. He did discover evidence of Kroglin Hall and High Halls. Kroglin Hall is probably the house indicated, Harper writes in his 1907 book, but it is at least a mile distant from the church which has been rebuilt. There is no tomb in the church church that, by any stretch of the imagination, could be identified with the one described by Mr. Hare. In the 1930s, another researcher, F. Clive Ross, called the story into question. Ross interviewed residents and concluded that Kroglin Hall was Kroglin Grange. On the grounds of the Grange, there was a chapel built in the foundation of an earlier church. Mrs. Sparkin, a local, was one of the people Ross interviewed. This instable resident claimed to have personally known a Fisher family descendant. Mrs. Sparkin stated that he was born in the 1860s and grew up hearing about vampires from his grandparents. 
The lady also revealed that the property's deed stated that Kroglin Low Hall was known as Kroglin Grange until 1720. A more recent investigation into the authenticity of the Kroglin vampire was conducted by journalist Lionel Fanthorpe. His findings imply that some events could be genuine. Fanthorpe believes that a grange or farmhouse was demolished during Oliver Cromwell's reign. If the story is true, it is much more likely to have happened in the century before the deed was changed. Hey everyone! I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took time out of your day to listen to my narration. This is Nikki of Twisted Mind, and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Salamat!